Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome to um, today's webinar. Um, with me is Dr. Willie Hendrickson. Hi, Willie. Hi, Julie. Hi. Okay, so I know Willie is a very popular speaker, usually with a ton of Q&As. So without further ado, Willie, I will pass the ball to you because I know you have prepared some slides that will introduce yourself and nothing does it better than yourself. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Julie, and thank everyone for, for joining us today. I'm here to talk today about challenges and opportunities in particle processing and industrial perspective. This is a talk that I gave last September in Madrid at the World Congress of Particle Processing. And the reason I wanted to redo this talk is there seemed to be a lot of interest, uh, particularly among academics uh, in it, and students about just what is it when we're doing industrial processing, solids handling, industrial processing. So, with no further ado, let me let me uh, start start the the presentation, and we'll we'll see what we can find here. I'm gonna uh, the the outline of my talk is uh, just a short overview of Avika, and the question I'm gonna ask and answer is how did I get here, and in fact, how did all of us get into this particle processing area? It's kind of an interesting thought process. Why do we care about particle processing, the general challenges in particle processing, economics, technology, readiness level, examples and future directions. So let's let's get let's get going and see what we can see what we can come up with today. So it, Avika itself, if, if you haven't heard one of my talks before, we're a particle processing company. We're focused on contract manufacturing. We were founded in, in 1994 uh, as a spinoff from 3M. And since that time, we've grown from three people to 280 people. Uh, we, we range in many different areas from food processing to industrial uh, chemical processing to personal care processing and beyond that. As a contract manufacturer, let's see if we can, yes, there it is. As a contract manufacturer, you know, we consider ourselves slightly different as a, as a contract manufacturing organization. Number one, as I just uh, mentioned, we have a broad range of industrial areas, but we also have a broad range of unit operations ranging from uh, grinding to spray drying to agglomeration, some of the topics that Julie was, was talking about. We also have a very active research and development group. So, you know, we are, we are looking to work with our customers and people that call us up on how to develop that product or that process. And finally, the way that we work is what we call an extreme technical and collaborative business model. It really, uh, you know, in, in this area, there's so many small details that make big differences that if you don't work together closely, and that's gonna be part of the topic of my, my talk, and understand what these details are, it just doesn't work. For us, you know, we get a lot of inquiries, over 2,000 inquiries a year. We, we write up over 600 project proposals every year, and we have 300 customers every year. And the reason I tell you this isn't so much to talk about how big we are or how many things that we do or how small we are, depending on your per, per perspective, but to give you an idea, the breadth of what we see, I mean, every inquiry is different, every project proposal is different, and all our customers have you know, just this wide range of interests and needs and everything. So what we end up seeing is a lot of different uh, process areas and, and problems. It, it makes for a very interesting life. And in fact, as I've, as I've said many, many times, I have the best job in the world. Listening to all these questions and comments and trying to find a, a, an answer to them, for me, it's, it's just exciting to be able to do this. The way that we, the way that we, handle all of this and one of the reasons that we're here today with with Hariba is we do an awful lot of particle characterization and it's my contention that if you're not characterizing something you don't know what you're doing so whether it's characterizing it during manufacturing so you can make sure that you're consistent or characterizing you know your process your materials you know what are you doing to, to see what what you what you have you know we do a lot of particle size measurement we do a lot of imaging whether it's SEM uh, densities, flow properties, formulation analyses. You know, the, the point of this slide is to really, you know, focus on that in order for us to come up with the answers, we do this by, by the characterization. Now, the question that, that, that I want to ask all of you and, and ask myself, how the heck did you ever get into particle processing? 
you know, whether you're a student still, you know, deciding that you're going to go into this area, or whether you're a you're a classically classically trained chemical engineer that that you know you were trained in solids or liquids and, and gases, and all of a sudden you find yourself handling solids. Well, I have a I have a, a, a story to tell you about how I got to, to here. And you know, as it starts out, I think that we're inculcated with particle processing from the earliest age. So this is this is a, a, a scan of my life where I started out building sandcastles when I was two years old, maybe even younger than that. When I was five years old, I had the opportunity to work with my uncle on a farm and he wanted to lay some concrete. And so there I was five years old, helping him dig up sand out in our sand pit and then mix concrete and pour concrete. Well, that's a particle process. When I was nine years old, I visited a taconite plant and I'll tell you what that is in just a second. When I was 12, I was back on my uncle's farm uh, grinding up uh, animal feed, grinding up corn. That's not a picture of me, but it, it could have been. That's exactly how, how it worked. When I was 14, my parents you know, made the mistake and bought me a chemistry set. And I didn't care about all the chemistry part, although I am a chemist. I mean, that, that's, that's what I ended up uh, getting my degree in. I ended up mixing up gunpowder, which is a blending process, which is a particle process. So once again, I got right into particle processing, not calling it that. I was making gunpowder. I was having a lot of fun with that. When I, when I went to graduate school, when I was age 21, I started doing synthesis and I was doing crystallization, once again, a particle process. When I started at 3M, one of my first jobs was uh, working on a xerographic process, photocopying, which is a lot of particles. When I was 31, I started baking bread, which is a particle process once again. And finally, when I was 34, I had the, the realization when I became a manager of a particle processing group at 3M, that I really had done a lot of particle processing up to this point, although I had never called it that. My suspicion is each one of you also have gone through something similar. And if you tack off your life like this and you look at it, you go, oh my God, I've been doing solids processing my whole life. I just didn't realize it. When I was 35 years old, I joined an organization called IFPRI, the International Fine Particles Research Institute. I'm the president of, of IFPRI when I was 61. And when I was 41, I left 3M and started my own company, Avika. So, you know, I can say I've either been in particle processing for the last 37 years since I, I'm 34 years old, or I've been doing particle processing for the last 69 years. I, I guess I guess we can all kind of look at that. So having said that, I got here by a number of, of odd steps. And, you know, I suspect that your story, once again, is going to be similar to that. But, you know, why does anybody really care about particle processing? Well, I have four examples here that are so industrially or, or societally impactful that, that they just need to be talked about. In the 1930s, uh, the iron ore industry in Minnesota was running out of high-grade ore, and they, they started using low-grade ore, and they beneficiated it. Well, what they found out is that they could make this work. They could actually take that low-grade ore and beneficiate it up, so we had went from 40 years of... of uh, proven reserves up to 700 years of proven reserves with the, with the taconite. But they found out that the only way they could make it work was to agglomerate it. And those pellets that you see being held by, by that, that person, those are, those are iron ore pellets, taconite pellets, we, we call them. Those, what, what happened about this is that, you know, particle processing allowed us to really expand the amount of iron ore we had, but even more important, going from a small particle to this agglomerated particle, the Bessemer furnaces, excuse me, the, the blast furnaces that were making the, the iron actually operated five times faster. So not only did we extend our reserves, but particle processing made the steel, the iron and steel industry five times more efficient. Cement manufacturing is probably one of the largest uh, industrial uh, materials that are used in the world. It uses up an incredible amount of energy. And in fact, it's one of the highest energy users in the world. And understanding how they can effectively reduce that energy, and it's a grinding process, is, is part of the, the big use of energy, is something that has happened. And the energy usage has gone down by 50% because of what particle processing has done. I mentioned xerography earlier. Uh, if you've ever looked at a photocopying machine and seen how it actually works, it is particle processing solids handling on steroids, from the handling 
to the charging, to the actual forming of the of the image, particle processing in there is probably the most amazing uh, particle processing operation that that we're commonly commonly exposed to, and we don't really know too much about it. And finally, I think all of us are, are well aware of you know the impact of COVID, but the impact of particle technology to actually make those liposomes to make the vaccines was was a a tremendous uh, uh, contribution from particle processing. Who cares about particle processing? We all do. Well, having said that, you know, let's just consider the big challenges in particle processing or solids handling. And I've broken this up into two things, operations and technology. From an operations, I wanna to talk today to you about, and I will in a second, about the economics of particle processing. I also wanna to talk to you about technology readiness levels and the the difficulty of going through the valley of death, which I'll explain in a bit. But let's look at the, the technology. As a person uh, in solids handling, the biggest problem I deal with every single day, and you probably do the same thing if, if you're in particle processing, is water. It, you know, if I either have to dry it or remove it or filter it off, those ones you know, are almost handleable. The one that's very difficult is the fact that we have different amounts of water in the atmosphere and it changes everything. It changes the powder flow. And you look up at the, the top left here, you can see the, the picture of the, the uh, uh, chunky powder that was made that, that happened because of water absorption. You can see the example of the spray dried aluminum sulfate here. That's a nice crystalline structure that when it was exposed to water, it sucked up water in it and degraded the structure, went from a crystalline to almost an amorphous. And then you can look at the example of what I call hammer rash. Hammer rash is where anywhere in your plant that the powder doesn't flow through a pipe, the operators in that plant eventually find it. And the way they fix that is they start pounding on that pipe, that, that uh, bin, that hopper, uh, to get the powder to move and you end up with this hammer rash. I'm not sure if there's a plant in the world that doesn't have at least one example of this in their plant. Grinding efficiency is another one and we're gonna talk about all these. So let's get started on, on this first example. And the example is economics. So we're gonna talk about spray drying. To the right side of the screen, what I have is a, is a cross section of a small spray dryer. This is a little, bench top spray dryer, it might be two feet high, one foot wide and one foot deep. Basically it has a chamber, the heated chamber that we spray liquids into and we dry that liquid and the small droplets that are formed in the atomization process and it, the solids that are in that, that liquid dry and we collect it in a cyclone. Uh, that cyclone you can see over here on, on num number, number seven, is a cyclone and then the rest of it is collected in a in a bag house or a filter of some sort. Well, this little teeny spray dryer might do a half a pound or a hundred grams of water an hour. I mean, very small amount of, of liquid goes through that, that, that dryer. You might make a gram of that powder. The reality is from an industrial standpoint, the equipment is a little bit bigger. And you can see at the bottom of this slide, this is the bottom of one of the spray dryers that we have in our, our plants. This is a dryer that is not drying 100 grams of water an hour. This is a, this is a dryer that's drying 6,000 pounds of water an hour. In essence, what we have here is you're seeing the bottom of this dryer. If we could look up the, the dryer that goes up 80 feet, it's about 20 feet in diameter. Uh, and it's this monstrous piece of equipment that costs anywhere from $6 million up to $80 million to put in one of these dryers. This is an expensive piece of equipment. Now, what we're looking for in this, in order to, to get the, the, you know, to understand how we're gonna get value out of this, is you know, looking at numbers of different process parameters, but we're, you know, two that I'm gonna talk about today are the input solids, the solids that are in the, the liquid that we're drying, and the drying rate. How many pounds of water per hour can I dry, or kilograms that I can dry? Typically in a big dryer like this, I'm gonna get a 98 to 99% yield. And for me and my, my business, I wanna make somewhere between five and 700 pounds of water dollars an hour. 
So let's let's think about what happens when we change the the percent solids. If you if you look at it, if we dried at one percent solid, so I have one pound of solids, one pound of one kilogram of solids per uh, per a hundred kilograms of solution, I would only get out twenty kilograms an hour. However, if I'm at fifty percent solids, I would get two thousand kilograms out per hour. Big difference, you know. I obviously I want to operate in a higher percent solid so I can get more product out and I can charge my customer less. So just think about this. If I want 500 pounds an hour, $500 an hour, I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge this person at 1% solids, I'm gonna charge this person $25 a kilogram, but if I'm going up to 2,000 kilograms an hour and I want $500, I might only charge them 25 cents. Big difference. But let's look at, you know, you know that, that big difference. You can easily see that. But in when we're doing industrial processing, we're actually looking at much smaller differences. So on this slide, I'm looking at what happens if we have 20% solids and it varies between 19 and 20% solids. Let's talk about the operational time that, that we're actually running at. And let's assume that we have a 2000 kilogram per water, water evaporation rate dryer. So let's just look at 20% solids. If I have 20% solids, I can manufacture 500 kilograms of product, kilograms of product per hour. If I actually am operating my dryer 80% of the time, I can make 3.5 million kilograms, 90%, 3.5, 3.9, and 4.2 kilograms, depending on whether it's 80, 90, or 95% solid uptime, excuse me. Now, you know, so why would why would we have more uptime or less uptime? The the reality in an industrial dryer, we want to turn the dryer on and we want to run it all the time. Realistically, 95% means it's all the time because there's always time that you have to take the dryer down to clean it, to fix something, to to do what it is. So if you can get 95% uptime on your dryer, you're doing very, very well. If you're running 90% of the time during a, during a month, that means that you're down six days a month. That's probably one or two cleanups because it takes two to three days to clean up a dryer as big as I'm talking about. If you're 80%, you're down um, three days for the 90% and, and uh, six days for the uh, 80%. So you might be down twice on 80% to clean it up and once once a month to, on, on 90%. Now, if we actually look at this, if I just change from 20 to 19%, I go down to 469 kilograms per hour, or if I go up to 21, I go up to 400, 532. Well, it doesn't seem like that much for, for uh, you know 31 kilograms an hour, but when you multiply this by the number of hours, look at the difference. At 19% solids and 80% uptime, I'm at a, 3.3 million kilograms per year. And at 95% and 21% solids, I'm at 4.4. I typically get a dollar a kilogram or even more for something like this. So if we just use a dollar a kilogram, being at 21% versus 19 and having my dryer operate more efficiently longer, I can make $1.2 million. Small, small changes make big differences in the economics of, of your of your dryer process. The the other thing that, that can happen is your dryer might operate at different water evaporation rates. And this can happen because of the moisture in the air, your evaporation rate goes down. This can happen because you raise the temperature up a little bit more, so you might get a higher evaporation rate. This might happen because you have a hole in the dryer and this negative uh, pressure in your dryer is drawing cold air into your dryer, which is slowing your dryer down. So by going from once again 19% solids to 21% solids, just by by having uh, higher higher th uh, higher throughput rates, you can you can go from this 446 kilograms an hour to 558. That's over $100 an hour just by by operating just a slightly faster dryer evaporation rate. There's another aspect that I that I want you to consider about this from an economic standpoint. 
I told you that the dryer rate is usually 98%, and it is. I mean, you got a big dryer, 98%, 99% is a very reasonable. So the actual output is not 500 kilograms an hour, but 490 kilograms an hour at 98%. However, there, here's, the, here's the, the, the dirty little secret when we talk about uh, yields in a dryer. In a dryer, you know, 8% water retained is not an unusual amount and in fact I want to retain as much water as I can so theoretically I should be getting out 543 kilograms an hour but I'm only getting out 490 what happened to the other 53 kilograms what where did this stuff go well I've shown over here a dust storm and and some of it is we we our dryers don't look like this in fact nobody's dryer looks like this but we do lose some of the particles out the stack. You know, the, the cyclones and the filters aren't perfect. And so there's some loss there. And I would say that that's probably around 30 kilograms an hour. So, you know, of the 53, I, I probably have 30 going out the stack in one way or the other. We have it, we have it collected in some secondary collection areas that we can't use, uh, but some of it just actually is, is released. And there's parameters that you have to abide by. The other 23 kilograms per hour is washed down the drain because you spilled some on the floor, you're cleaning up your dryer afterwards and there's product that sticks in your dryer. So you have these, you have 53 kilograms an hour that you're losing. Plus if your dryer isn't operating optimally, you'll lose some there. These are things that when, when, I, was, when I was a student, when I was scaling up a process or when I was developing a process, I never think of, but the reality is the economics really means that you have to pay attention to not only your rates, your how good your dryer's operating, and what's going on with all the all the uh, mass balances that are going on. So if we look at this from an economic overview, and I can tell you that this type of economic overview you would see with any particle process. Spray drying is one that I use as an example here, but grinding and other ones have that very similar. I have this listed about. Uh, water evaporation rate and operation time. These are processes that you can you can control yourself very easily. What happens to the relative humidity of the air coming in, you can you can modify that. You know, your preventive maintenance is, you know, do you have holes in your dryer? Uh, your cleaning time, your preventative maintenance once again. These are these are good engineering things for you to be able to to look at. The ones in the red, the percent solids if my viscosity goes up too high, I can't spray dry it. If my yields are, are poor because I have wall sticking, which means that you know the powder flow isn't right, you know these are these are some technical you know academic challenges that we struggle with. The way that most of us figure this out and get the best out of our dryers is we know some tricks. And and in whatever solids processing that you're going. Knowing the tricks is one of the most important things that you can actually do. So here I have I have two pictures. I have a picture of Carl Friedrich Gauss, a uh, 19th century mathematician, a very famous mathematician, and I have a picture of my three grandchildren. They all of them know the same trick. The story goes, and and you know there's there's some there's some license to how this story actually happened, but the story goes that when Carl Friedrich Gauss was a uh, child or a, a, in grade school, he was a math prodigy even then. And he was always bugging his teacher for you know, a new problem, you know, give me something I can do. And finally one day the, the teacher got, gets tired of this and says, well, here, why don't you go and add up all the numbers from one to a thousand? And when you're done with that, come back to me. The math teacher, the professor, the, the teacher absolutely is convinced that he's got a couple hours to himself and you know who knows if he'll even get the, the, the answer right. Carl Friedrich Gauss came back in 30 seconds and had the answer. When you add up the numbers from one to a thousand, the answer is 500,500. Carl Friedrich Gauss figured out a trick that he used that I've taught Oren, Nora, and Lena who are now 16, 14, and 10 to be able to do the same thing. And in fact, they can add up all the numbers from one to a million in the same 30 seconds. 
knowing that trick, and I won't tell you the trick, I'll let you go and look it up. It's it's an amazing, it's amazing mathematical trick, and you can use it for a lot of lot of interesting things. But knowing that trick and knowing the tricks that you can apply to particle processing can help you make your dryers, your grinders, your agglomerators operate better. So let me give you a couple examples of some of the tricks that I use. Uh, the, down in the lower right corner is a picture of a heat exchanger. One of the ways that we get higher percent solids to our dryer is we heat up the liquid so it has lower viscosity. And so instead of putting the, the liquid in at room temperature or even elevated temperature, we pressurize it and we send it to the dryer at 120 degrees C, above the boiling point, but it's under pressure. So we can actually get lower viscosity, higher, higher throughput through our dryer, just by doing that simple trick. Another trick that we've used is, you know, what is the construction of Kiwi shoe polish? And I'm, I'm showing here with the, the person with the black uh, shoe polish that he's about to polish, polish their shoes. It turns out, you know, when you ask somebody what does what makes up Kiwi shoe polish, they go, well, it's made up of wax. Well, it's not quite that. It turns out there is some wax in there, but Kiwi shoe polish is 90% kerosene and 10% wax. When you put the wax into the kerosene, it doesn't do anything until you heat it up, melt the wax, the wax dissolves in the kerosene, and when you cool it down, the wax precipitates out and changes that kerosene from a very flowable liquid to a paste. This is what's called an organogelation uh, system. It's a trick that we use here to handle the viscosity, change the viscosity, thermally change the viscosity by doing, um, by doing this addition of these materials into organic liquids. So we can change the viscosity and people do this in a regular basis for just about all kinds of creams and gels and waxes and the grease in your car and gelled candles and napalm. These are all the same type of trick. If you know this, you can use this. I'll give you another example. Uh, I have a picture here of two candles, one that's burning and one that's just been put out. And we've all seen this. We've seen the the uh, the candle that, that's burning brightly and you can see some soot coming off of there. Uh, that soot is nanoparticulate carbon black or, or uh, yeah, carbon, carbon black. Uh, this is something that people have used for for uh, thousands of years to make lamp black. This is how you make lamp black. Or what's going on when you put the candle out? Notice there's there's a a, uh, a smoke coming off of it. This is slightly different smoke. If you understand what this is, you're not making carbon black on the second one. What you're actually making is nanoparticulate wax. And what happens, the way a candle actually works is the wick is used to uh, transport the liquid wax up to the flame, which then burns by first vaporizing the wax and then burning. When you, when you blow out the, 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 uh, the flame, the wick is still warm enough to vaporize the wax and now it condenses and forms nanoparticles. In one, one system here, the trick is, is knowing that you can get lamp black out of it. In another way is if you can just heat it up but not burn it, you can actually make nanoparticulate wax particles. Why do we really want to know this? Why do we want to know these tricks? Because the challenge in industry is to take this process, this process that you develop in the lab, and get it up to manufacturing. In the early, in the late uh, 60s, there's some people at NASA that were looking at when is a technology ready to fly on a on a on a space shuttle rocket uh, launch to the moon, whatever. And they came up with this level that said, this is this is this is as you see here, is what happens when you're developing something. You first start it with a basic concept, you go to some lab and bench testing, and finally you go through some field tests and commercialization. These are the technology readiness levels. All the ideas start down here at the basic concept. All the commercial is up at the top. In between is what is called the valley of death. And the valley of death is the area that you need to go to from that great idea that you have to the commercialization. It turns out the people that come up with the idea always feel that they have the hardest job. And the people that are doing the production always feel that they have the hardest job because they need to do it consistently. I would, I would, offered that the people in the middle trying to scale up something have the highest job 
and this is why it's called the valley of death. So what is actually the valley of death? The valley of death is really the answer to questions of what process should I use? How much do I need? What's my yield? What is the raw materials? How can I rework the product? What are the quality issues I have? If you answer those 10 questions and the other 12,457 questions, you have gotten through the valley of death. In essence, what the valley of death is the answer to the questions that can be asked to actually mitigate the risk of going from a bench scale to a, or a concept to production. One of these, the, the, these questions that really come is, is what I call processing dilemmas. And these could be processing dilemmas in just about any area, but I'm always thinking about solids handling. It's the availability equipment dilemma. If you're, if you have a good idea and you're in the lab and you're going to, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to grab a coffee grinder and you're going to grind it up. And boy, if that works, the next thing you're thinking about, how many coffee grinders do I need? Or how can I get a bigger coffee grinder? You know, that's not the way it works. I mean, you have to go to some different equipment, but when you start out with a coffee grinder, you now are using that available equipment and you might be taking yourself down the wrong path. There's the scalability dilemma. Uh, I have a picture here of a of a lab distillation system, nice little piece of glassware that you can distill and, and do things. If you look at the if you look at the other picture here, this is what it what it looks like to have a large uh, distillation column. They don't even look the same, and they're so much different in how they operate that you can end up end up having completely odd odd results as you're trying to scale something up. People typically forget about mass balances when they're when they're uh, you know coming up with an idea, and optimization. You know who even who even knows about that? But that is what the valley of the valley of death actually is. Come on, let's get to the next one. Uh, so why is scaling so difficult? You know when you're starting up with this new idea that you have. You know whether you're a you're an academic doing your research, or whether you're an industrial person. You, you know, you're just trying to make it work to start with, and you don't really care about efficiencies. You don't really care about alternative processes. You don't care about which equipment that you use. You, you know, what's a mass balance? Who cares? You know, you're you're just trying to get this out. So you put this all together, and then you you finally get something that works, and you enter into the valley of death. And now you can die in the valley of death. You can you cannot have enough water. You cannot have enough money. You cannot have enough food. If you work your way through that, if you answer all those questions, at the other end is the manufacturer that's going to manufacture your product. And guess what? They don't care. They really don't care because they want to run the same process. They have process standards. They don't want to modify the equipment. They have operators that are already trained. So if you have exactly the product that uses exactly their equipment, uses the same procedures, uses the same operations, has the same safety, they might like it. But if there's anything different about it, all that work that you went to, you have to find somebody that's willing to take a risk. So you need to mitigate that risk and get to a spot. So going through all of this, you know, this this idea of economy and and uh, uh, scaling up, these are the problems that all of us are facing in industrial solids handling, and they're incredibly difficult problems. So. I have four examples here for you today. I've listed six, but we're only going to talk about four. Uh, we're going to we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what is it that was needed, how did we approach the problem, what went right or wrong, and what are the opportunities for better understanding in this solids handling area. So the first one is I'm just going to talk about blending. It's got to be the easiest thing in the whole world, right? You're just going to blend something, and I'm not even going to blend two solids here. I'm going to blend something easy. I'm going to blend a solid and a liquid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a food product and I'm going to add water to it. So I'm starting off at 1% moisture and I'm going up to 5%. That's a good place to be because if you go too high in moisture, you can get to a spot where microbial growth can happen. The reason that we dry lots of food products is to you know stop the microbial growth. So I'm going to use something. I've got a small particle. It's you know 75 microns in size. I'm going to use a ribbon blender. I'm going to spray atomize onto it. You know, kind of, this isn't a ribbon blender, but it shows spray atomization. In this particular case, the additional water causes the particles to slightly swell. I'm just showing you a particle size distribution that I could have shown you the, the two of them. They almost end up on top of each other, slightly different. 
And so this is now just a simple blending. You know, think about this. If you're in, if you're in your kitchen or you're in your lab, you put it into a cup or a bowl or something, and you stir it up with a spoon, and, you, and you've got it all done. But, you know, industrial, it's not much different. I used a I used a ribbon blender. The blending was perfect. You know, we had no problems with it. What went wrong? Everything. We ended up with the greatest micro growth that we've ever seen in our whole life. So this is just a picture of bread with some mold growing on it, but that's about what it looked like. It was incredible. What happened was, is even though uh, on a macroscopic scale, we had 5% moisture throughout all of this product, on a microscopic scale, the blending wasn't done. And in fact, this is one of the real problems with, with blending, you know, from an industrial standpoint, is that this, this process doesn't go very well. And what you end up, what we ended up with is dry spots and wet spots. We, we didn't know how to measure them, dry spots and wet spots. And in those wet spots, they were above the amount of water needed for microbial growth. And guess what? It, it, it grew all right. The, the interesting thing about this area, you know, from an industrial standpoint, we don't have a real good method for determining the uniformity of powder on a microscopic scale. On a macroscopic scale, we can measure it, we can we can tell you what it is, but on a microscopic scale, you know, are you uniform or not? We don't have it. This is one of the this is the easiest thing that we can do blending, and it's also one of the most difficult to actually get happen, to, to actually work out. Classification optimization. So, you know, this is just screening. I just want to separate one size particle from another. We use a uh, uh, an air classifier. This is one of the pieces of equipment that we build and sell. It allows us to separate small particle sizes and and get get some uh, different distributions. So we're going to actually sell, uh, uh, separate glass bubbles or glass beads, glass bellatini. It's the classic uh, academic uh, uh, question that we finally had an industrial process that was actually doing this. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to cut off the bottom particle size here. We want to cut off the bottom 10 to 15 microns on here and actually get a tighter distribution. Our customer had a real need to have this done between 25 microns and 48 microns. And you can see this is the distribution that we got here. We had a D50 of about 35 microns and a, you know, a D90 of 48 and a D10 of 25 microns. But we said, you know, what happens if we just expand the, the distribution three microns? two microns on the high side and one micron on the low side. It's a little bit broader distribution. Well, you know, my mind doesn't say that that's gonna really make a lot of, a lot of difference from, from a yield standpoint. And if we look here on this next slide, you can actually see what the starting beads look like from a distrib, uh, just what they look like to a broad cut to a narrow cut. And you know, the broad cut and the narrow cut don't look that different, but look at the difference in percent yield. 43% yield on the narrow cut. And with a three micron broader span, I had 73% difference in, in yield. Now, if you look at that, 43% was not going to be an economical uh, industrial process. 73% actually was. And so pushing that boundaries and not just listening to what our customer asked for, but saying, you know, let's take a, let's look at some, we looked at a number of different ranges. But this one was was really was really great one to get that higher yield. Now the question really comes in here is the this there are no models for for separation efficiency. There, there none none exist, and so you basically have to look at it every time. I have two more examples, and you know I, I'm going to try to get done so Julie has time for for my questions. Uh, grinding optimization, you know. Lots of grinding is done in the world. It's an incredibly energy inefficient process. Two to four percent of the energy that you use to crush something, to grind something, actually goes into particle breakage. The rest is moving stuff around and it's wasted in many other ways. We had a step, we had a process that somebody wanted to grind a ceramic and, and tighten the distribution uh, or, or go from a, a big distribution to a uh, uh, tighter distribution uh, as time went on. What we found and, and what everybody finds out is that grinding in steps, we went from a crushing step to a, a hammer milling step to a ball milling step. We could actually tighten up the distribution as time went on. This is a, 
of pieces of what our, what our equipment looks like, our crushers on the left here uh, and over on the side here. And the, the grinder is the, the blue the blue spot here. Uh, and then we have some ball mills uh, put in here. So we, we set this system up to do this. And the results we got were shown here. So we're starting out with big ceramic parts, different sizes. And in 2003, when we started this, we had a D50 of 15 to 35 microns, and we were crushing and ball milling. As the needs from our customer got to be tighter, we found out that hammer milling and ball milling was, was better. By 2013, we, we still needed a tighter distribution, and so now we had the three steps, the crushing, the hammer milling, and the ball milling. And it took a long time to get to these things. I mean, just because it, it seems easy here, it was not, not, not easy to get to. What we added in 2015, you know, this was 12 years later, we've added a grinding aid, and grinding aids are liquids that improve the grinding, the breakage efficiency. We were actually able to get a tighter distribution, and we we're also able to get a, a faster grind. So instead of taking an hour, it took us 20 minutes to get this same grind to, to get down to this tighter distribution. The interesting thing about all this is, is that we increased the energy uses. If we, we cut our time by a third, we, we tripled the energy efficiency. So we went from about 3% to 10%. This idea of grinding aids to improve your process is one of these tricks that, that, that we use and one of them that we should always be looking at. But once again, you know, point out that small changes here made big differences in the final, the final uh, economics of the whole system. The last example I'm going to use, uh, going to talk about in the next three minutes, is making monodispersed beads. We we use a process called prilling, where we atomize a liquid like a wax, a melted wax, and let it fall down, very much like a spray drying process, but instead of evaporating, it's freezing. Now, if we wanted to make a one millimeter bead, I can do this in about 20 feet. I can drop it for 20 feet, and it can get cool enough. When I get to a four millimeter bead, I need about a hundred feet to drop this, to get it cold enough so it's a hard bead and not still soft. The problem is, is I don't have a hundred foot tower, nor do I have a hundred foot building to drop this in. So I had to figure out, we had to figure out how to, how to do this. And what we did is we changed from an atomization into air to an atomization into water. Water has a higher heat capacity and we were able to shorten our hundred foot tower down to a foot, a foot and a half maybe. And so schematically, instead of dropping it from the top and letting it fall down, we actually atomized underwater and allowed it to rise from hot water to cold water. This allowed us to keep the, the nozzle working and freeze the bead as it got to the top. This is, this is the beads that we actually saw uh, that we obtained. This is what the the process looks like. I, I'm not going to run the, the video today, uh, but you know you'd actually see these beads rise up and then uh, be collected up at the top. Uh, but what we what we end up is getting beads that look like this, but it didn't quite work. You know, so you know, really a, a smart move. You know, taking that hundred foot tower down to a foot and a half, or down to yeah you know, about a foot and a half. But you know what happened was is we actually entrained water. So you can see these small holes in here, and our customer couldn't abide by the water. So we actually had a way of making monomodal beads. We could actually do it in a very short method. We knew the trick, we figured out the trick. But you know, there's something else that was going on here, this entrainment of water. So I, I'm I'm gonna skip this uh, uh, plasma cutter uh, one and just give you kind of the, the overview. It's really all about economics. In industrial challenges of particle processing, small changes have huge effects. Understanding these processing tricks and this understanding the material knowledge can have all kinds of uh, uh, economic effects on how you can how you can do better at characterization, atomization, grinding, powder flow. If you really want to get an idea of how tough it is to uh, start up a solids processing plant. Uh, please read the article by Ed Merrill. He published this in 1988, and it's still germane. You know, our question that, that we've always asked, does anybody really understand the critical value 
of particle processing and profitability. And you know, there's there's a real question that 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 they might not. You know, where can you actually find information on this? You know, go to the World Congress next time. It'll be in uh, Japan next year. You know, the the AICHE Particle Technology Forum. Equipment vendors and and modeling vendors have lots of information for you. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm the president of the International Fine Particle Research Institute. Uh, we've commissioned a new Mero report. Uh, we've got it in our hand, and it you know confirms that it's still very difficult to do it. But you know, the International Fine Particles Research is a consortium of industrial companies that bring together practitioners to really help talk about uh, the way to come up with the best answers. In summary, if you're a particle processing person, it's the best place in the whole world to be. It's exciting. It's difficult. Uh, but there's there's opportunities all over the place, both in industrial and academia. If you really want to, you know, to to make the best of, of being in this career, reach out to others for help. And Julie, with that, I think I'm done. Well, thank you so much, Willie, for your excellent talk. So we will enter into our Q&A session. So the question that came in is, how do I reduce sample bias for non-cohesive or segregating powders? Wow, you know, sampling bias is always is always a challenge, right? It's loaded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I, I I could I you know, let me give a whole other talk now on on that. But you know, that if you're really worried about sampling bias, uh, people use riffler, uh, rifflers, rifflers, uh, you know, separation uh, systems that will actually automatically separate your sample and that's always a good idea and you do it two or three times and you can get a, a good a good uh, sample so when when we've sampled some of the the big systems we can't put it through a, a riffler there are there are systems for doing automatic sampling on super sacs uh, and we do that or you you do thieves through the system and typically on a super sac you know 2,000 pound sample we'll take five or six samples and then combine those, separate them, and and do a sample. It's 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 a challenge to get a good one, and cohesive powders are are even are even more of a challenge. It's a great question. It's a whole talk though. I agree. I think there was a whole book written around sampling, um, really depending on the size of your powders. Is it you know in the micron size or is it in the millimeter size? Second question, I enhance my comprehensive understanding re related to typical industrial challenges. Can you suggest how to identify a real world issue? Well, I, I, a real world issue in industrial processing, I, I think I gave you a, a, whole, a whole series of them. How to get the most efficiency out of your dryer, how to get the most efficiency out of your grinder. How to uh, you know classify, separate particles? I, I could give you some you know examples on you know how to how to optimize either particle coating or or agglomeration. Uh, you know every single one of those problems and blending. Oh my God! You know there's a, a thousand questions in blending. Uh, you you do blending and you know you blend perfectly and then you blend a little bit longer and it resegregates. I mean, you know, all of these are, are great problems uh, for, from an industrial standpoint. If the person that's asking the question would like a longer answer and, you know, maybe talk about this, I, I you know, please send me an email. I'd, I'd love to love to have that discussion. The next question is concerning powder mixing and homogeneity, is it better to use a batch mixer or a continuous mixer? Yes. You know, you know, that's that that is a great question. That was a facetious answer. I'm sorry. Uh, I have seen, you know, the 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 right answer to be either one. I I I, I know that in, a, in in big volume industrial, they, they never can do batches because they're talking about millions of pounds of, of doing stuff. So they have to be continuous. And you know, and they work. You know, if everything lines out, you know, you can actually you can actually get that to work. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry, until just recently, has really focused on batch processing. Uh, they now are going to continuous processing. Uh, but you know, there's a, a lot of challenges: the startup and stop, and you know, small changes in your your configuration 
can dramatically change how efficient your blending homogeneity is. So, you know, the, the, the right answer is yes, they both work. They, yes, they're, they're both the best. Uh, and the specific answer to that a specific problem is, you know, please give me that, give me that answer and I'll, I'll give you my best guess on, on what it is, but I've seen it better both ways. And I've seen it, I've seen some problems that they just seem to be intractable, no matter which way you, which way you try to blend it. I hope that answers the question. Um, the next question is, what is the most effective way to separate one to 10 micron particles from one to 100 micron particles in a liquid media? In a liquid media, wow. Uh, so, you know, there, there's there's three ways that, that, that I would approach this. Um, you know, depending on where the cut point is, you know, one to 10 microns from, from you know, 100 micron particles, I might screen it, I might wet screen it. Uh, you know, but if I'm really trying to separate 10 micron particles from 20 micron particles, that, yeah, that's, I'm not going to screen that. I'm either going to do, use a hydrocyclone mm -hmm. as a, as a wet method for, for separating particles. It's, it's a, it's a statistical separation where you the bigger particles are thrown to the outside. The little particles will stay in the middle and you separate those two fractions of the water. Or, you know, the, the classic way to do it, and even down below one micron, is to do settling. So in the, in the abrasive industry, people separate different grit sizes of abrasive by putting them in pools and letting it separate and then uh, taking off the top fraction that's going to have the smaller particles and the bottom fraction is going to have your big particles. None of these, none of these answers are easy. Um, it, but you know separation at those sizes is always difficult you know even if it's dry it's difficult but wet you know you 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 ha at least you have the settling you have the hydrocyclones and you have screens just depending on the material that you're looking at good question thank you so hydrocyclone wet sieving or settling for those that are one micron or smaller or, or even you can you can separate even above that but you can separate down to less than a micron with settling. Perfect, thank you. Um, how varying the moisture affects powders and what can be done when you can't vary the moisture? Wow, you know, so, so I, you know, I, I, kind of, I kind of indicated that moisture will, will change the, the flowability and it does. And, you know, from there just comes one problem after another, if you can't, Control the flowability. How do you get it out of the bin? How do you get it out of the bag? How do you, how does it feed properly? The mm -hmm. the challenge that 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 one has, you know, if your if your issue uh, is you can't modify the 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 percent moisture, people typically will do one of two things. They will either add a flow aid, which is something like fume silica, into a system. So a small amount of fume silica decorates the surface and allows the particles to be separated from each other and so they'll flow better and so you can have consistent flow even with varying amounts of moisture or people will actually go the other way and agglomerate particles so they'll take those small cohesive particles agglomerate them and you'll now get much much better flow so both ways if, if you can't modify the moisture or control the moisture either agglomeration or the addition of of particulate flow aids works very, very nicely. By the way, fume silica is an all-time favorite of Dr. Mike Pohl here at Particle Characterization Lab. It's, 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 it's magic. <laughs> Next question, is there really a steady state in particle process? And then the follow-up question from the same person is, is, is there really, okay, I'm sorry, let me, so it's modified. Is there really a steady state and continuous particle processes? Is there a steady state? Um, you know, if you can get a, a long enough run, you know, I think that most people and the people that have studied this more than anybody are the, the pharmaceutical people. You, you can get a steady state in the middle of your run. The start of the run and the, the at the end of the runs, you can, you can, Things things change, but in the middle, I, you know, I think that that's a very reasonable to expect, and you work very hard to get to it. 
So I, I would say the answer is yes. You can, you can, on a general sense, get to a, a good steady state. And last but not least, I suspect this is an inside joke. Regarding to your Valley of Death slides, why do the national labs stops in the valley? I suspect that's an inside joke between you and the asker. <laughs> why do they stop in the valley? Yes. Uh, because <laughs> I think they don't know how to get out of it. How about that? <laughs> well, thank you so much for um, your excellent talk. I think we've reached the hour, so please do not hesitate to email us any follow-up questions that you may have. So on behalf of our particle group, thank you so much, Willie, for your time and preparing for this um, presentation. And thanks everyone for attending. We'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. Bye now. <laughs>